Rangers fans, welcome to Liberty Blue, the essential New York Rangers podcast. I am Andrew Chelney alongside Nick Zararis. And Nick, they beat Columbus in the rematch and then lost in a shootout to the Leafs. More importantly right now, though, trade deadline is this coming Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern time. It is hashtag insider and rumor season, baby. Uh. Well, sources are saying the New Jersey Devils have fired Lindy Ruff. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with the source at NJ Devils, but <laughs> sources are confirming that the Devils. I'm going to quote tweet Lindy and Ruff. put a a, th- a a finger emoji pointing to the to the graphic. Yeah, that's. I don't know why they waited so long. And Devils fans will say the same thing. It's it's not just an us thing. Devils fans were arguing about this for a for a long time. Like Lindy Ruff. Sur- surpassed expectations last season, but this season has been pretty much a train wreck for the Devils all year long. And it's March 4th. The deadline is four days away. The Devils just got dumpstered in their last game. And you do it now? I mean, why didn't you do it three months ago when the results were exactly the same? The thing with the Devils and you and I, I will say, I don't even have to say just you and I. Every single Ranger fan looked around and started giggling at each other when they saw the Devils hired Lindy Ruff to be their head coach three years ago now. Like, we couldn't believe somebody was taking, wanted the guy who was coaching the worst defense in the entire NHL. I'm not exaggerating. The New York Rangers from 2018 to 2020 gave up the most scoring chances of any team in the National Hockey League with the David Quinn and Lindy Ruff tandem of coach and assistant head coach. The worst defensive team in the entire league. This is a team that at one point featured Jacob Truba, Ryan Lindgren, Adam Fox, and Tony D'Angelo. I'm not saying all of those guys are good at hockey, but they are not the worst defensive unit in the entire league. That's I know they had Mark Stahl in there for a good stretch of those three seasons, but there was way too much talent for the defense to be that bad. And I understand the Devils just kind of wanted an adult in the room to kind of be the, the voice of moderation and regulation as they went through this weird period where they were going to start trying to ramp up and be competitive. And last year was the best case scenario. You know, they had that long winning streak at the early part of the season. They built up a nice, nice buoy of points where they were in first or second place most of the season. The Hurricanes eventually passed them. But the Devils are in a weird position where they waited too long. We could say the same thing about Pittsburgh. We could say the same thing about the Islanders, where when your season is derailing and it's November you have to be definitive by about Christmas. If you do not decide by Christmas to move on from your coach, you don't give yourself enough time because 40 games, if let's say you're under 500 and you you threw 40 games, you know, you've got like 25 ish wins and then like 15, five, whatever you're going to have to win like 700 percentage points of the way, the rest of the way. Like I was doing the math the other day and something I wrote the devils, if they want to make the playoffs now, they're going to have to win something in the neighborhood of 17 of their last 21 games. If they want a real chance. And that's just to make up with what the flyers are playing at right now. That does an account if the Flyers start playing better. So it feels like the Devils missed their boat. And as for the Rangers, uh, the Leafs game, Leafs are a good team. You went to a shootout. I can live with that. That's fine. Yeah. Good to get their look back against Columbus. The, the game last Sunday, that was kind of stinky, but good to get your win back. Not the best performance, but Columbus has enough talent where like, like I know Columbus isn't good, but talent wise, you know, Marchenko, Roslovic, th- they have enough guys where if you don't show up, they're going to make you work for it. And Columbus made the Rangers work for it on Wednesday. They did. And it's one of those situations where and we talked about this before, before the show that Philadelphia is a really good case study of teams that aren't very talented on paper, but they play better better than people think they can because they play hard and they play together. And Columbus was a Columbus is a team that they might not do it against every opponent, but for some reason they do it against the Rangers where they will show up and they might not blow you away if you look at the ro- if you look at the roster and you look at who's on the ice, but then they play and you're like this this team is this team is playing a lot better than the record is is suggesting that, that that they are. So they gave the Rangers a lot of problems and for some reason the past couple of seasons Columbus has been that kind of team for the Rangers where it's always been a, a close or a close game or Columbus ends up winning the game. Thankfully the Rangers came out and you know, they, they, they got the two points out of Columbus. You could first of all play who's in front of you, beat who's in front of you, but also two points or two points, no matter who you're playing, whether it be the Bruins, the Panthers or the God tonight, 
Columbus doesn't matter. They don't ask you how you got the points. They ask you how many points you got at the end of the season. So any win they got is 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 great. Toronto, I mean, listen, one of the best teams in the league, even though they had their struggles earlier on in the season, they've been playing a lot better, a lot, lot, lot better as of late. The the the, the t- they got the tying goal with like what a minute to go in, in regulation. Like that was a big goal. That that is a lot of the effort that that we want to see from this team. Like they didn't give up. They kept pressuring and it led to a goal shootout, whatever. That's it's a skills competition. I don't really care. I would rather continuous three on three on three overtime. That would be great, but that's neither here nor there at the end of the day, shootout loss, whatever. Nine one and zero in their last 10, the Leafs. And that's with, you know, pretty J- wall and Samsonov and you know one healthy defenseman that's decent in Morgan Riley uh the, the the Leafs are slowly putting it together you mentioned the Bruins I went to the Islanders Bruins game on Saturday I know the Bruins are dinged up but Jesus Christ that was the worst hockey game I've ever seen in person I don't think the Bruins strung together four straight passes the entire night like I understand they're missing a lot of guys both on the back end and up front but I mean Olmark was entirely out of his net and the Islanders shot the puck into a wide open net on three of the five goals. I do not understand how I, I I know that's one game and the Islanders are kind of showing signs of life, but I don't think I'm worried about the Bruins nearly as much as I was say a week ago when I see guys like Parker Wertherspoon being subject, Charlie McAvoy being subjected to playing with guys like Parker Wertherspoon who aren't NHLers. And I get it. You're injured. It's tough, but I just don't, see it from the Bruins like if you want to talk about the Leafs even the Leafs I know the Rangers just lost to them but that defense is awful (laughs) just objectively speaking they have like two NHL caliber defensemen on that back end and we're talking about a goalie tandem of Samsonov and Joe Wool and like I get it those guys are decent regular season goalies but how many times are the Leafs going to run this back with the map bottom six, the questionable defense and the goalie? I mean, you can say all you want. Austin Matthews might win the heart this year. Mitch Marner, maybe a Selkie guy this year. Four guys does not win a series as the Leafs will attest to you over the last five to 10 years. Yeah. It, there, when was the last time Leafs had a goalie that they could rely on? Freddie Anderson, like four or five years ago. That was the last time I felt yeah, decent yeah. about their goalie situation. But But he wasn't there long enough to where he was a quote unquote like long term solution. Like with the Rangers, Lundquist was here for decades. Freddie Shest- was there four and a half Shest- five years. Shest- Shest- Shesterkin's hope. I mean, by all accounts, going to be here for a long time as well. Like Richter was here for a long time. Now I know the Rangers are an anomaly because they, for some reason, always like their their goaltending scouting department is the best on the entire planet. I don't know how they keep doing it, but they keep doing it. They keep getting away with it, but. Teams like Toronto, it's seemingly like they haven't had a, 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 a like one goaltender they can rely on for a decade. Well, like they, they they haven't had That's that. That's uncommon, though. It you know, is, you I, just said it, it yourself. The Rangers are the anomaly, and the thing about the Leafs is when you don't have one of those five or six great goalies, you got to ride the goalie coaster. You think about how many teams Cam Talbot's been on in the last five to ten years. How many teams Mike Smith was on in the last five to ten years? When you don't have one of the special guys, you got to keep throwing shit at the wall. That's part of why the Leafs have had so many different guys. Is they know they can't stand pat with what they got. And one last thing before we transition the conversation towards the rangers the penguins are dead dead gone buried never to be heard from again they gave uh the calgary flames who actively are giving away guys because they know it's not their year looked great they made the flames look like the 1972 canadian olympic team kadri went around letang like he had never played hockey before and kadri's a good player don't get me wrong kadri's a good player having a good season But the Penguins just, that team is dead. That team has no life left. We know they are going to try and give away anything they can in the course of the next week as we transition to talking about the deadline here. So do you want to approach this from a league-wide perspective first or the Rangers perspective first of kind of like, this is who's available or this is who the Rangers are looking at? Which do you think is a more time-efficient way of doing this? Because there are a lot of names that have been linked to the Rangers. As one Twitter account I follow said, if you would like to be an NHL insider, say player A is linked to New York. That's all you have to do and you're officially an NHL insider. I mean, I think I think we could start with the, the overall league first because a lot of those big names could be good fits for the Rangers. Guys like Jordan Eberle, who's probably is probably is one 
of if he's not, one of mine. If yeah, it's not the Rangers, yeah. he's one of mine. He's one ideas. of the best options on the table. Yeah. If we like Jake Gensel aside for a second, Jordan Eberle is probably the best available winger on the market right now. I would say that. Booch, debatably, if Buchnevich is actually oh, yeah. available or not. It, um, right. Well, we, we, that's know that, thing. we know that Eberle is available. Booch yeah. has been rumored, quote, uh, with air quotes, but yeah. whether or not he's actually being proposed in trade deadline deals is up for debate. But we, we know for a fact that's, that Seattle is is listening to Jordan Eberle, and we know that because, one, all the insiders are now saying that you know he wants to stay. So now he's trying to get more money in, in, you know, the Eberle's agent has texted Elliot and said, Hey, we want more money. L- can you put this out that, that he wants to say, because we, you know, we're looking, we're looking at a, a long-term deal here. We, and Wenberg is, is also very much on the market right now. So yeah, that you could also, be a package deal. So you got guys like that. And then you go a tier down below that. You got guys like Fogel who may or may not be available Vetrano, Blackwell, Tarasenko, Duclair, Zucker, Riley Smith, Roslovich. If you're interested in more of an upside play, Arthur Kaliev of the uh, the Kings might be available. There are a lot of guys available, and I think that's in part because there's not a lot of great guys out there. This is a ver- this is a relatively weak deadline. And teams that may have been on the fence about selling realize that they're going to be able to get a pretty good price on some of these pieces. And I think that's incentivized some of these teams who have guys who may have term left. Guys like Scott Lawton, who I want no part of, but apparently the NHL GMs do. So when you have guys like that out there who have like term left, like when like Lawton has three years left on his deal. When guys like that are out there, that's a real strong indicator that this is a seller's market because there's just not a lot of great stuff out there. It's all or nothing for a lot of teams where you look at what's available and you go, okay, Gensel is available or at least rumored to be available. We, at this time of year, everybody is either always available or has never been available. It's it's you can you can't ever really tell with the, with, with the NHL, but let's just say for all of the names that have been rumored to be out there, let's just make it easier for ourselves and say all of them are available. So you have Gensel, you have Buchnevich, you have Eberle, Vetrano, and then like, that's the upper echelon of, of wingers. Can or I at throw least, one more in there for you? Yeah. Yeah. Trevor Zegers. <clears throat> Trevor Zegers is a, is a strange player. I don't know if he's like in terms, is he, at the level that like Jake Gensel and Jordan Eberle is? I think he's a little more facilitator than goal scorer. Like those two, those two guys are definitely more straightforward goal scorer and he's a little bit more playmaker and he may or may not even be available. I know that's one of those guys that's kind of just an easy lightning rod and an easy hundred thousand engagements on Twitter. So he gets in a lot of these columns, even though he might not actively be available, but for the purposes of this conversation, I think he's close enough to that tier where you could consider him and he's young enough where you could get the extension done and he lines up with the Luff Fernier, Fox, Miller age group, as opposed to the Zabinijag, Kreider, Trocek age group. That's really the main reason I wanted to throw him in there as well. So let me ask you this question. If the only <clears throat> forward trade the Rangers make is with Anaheim and they get Vetrano and Zegris, is that, I mean, obviously it depends on what goes out, but like, I would prefer that Henrique enough? and Zegris because they need a center because okay. Vetrano's a wing. That's yeah. the other thing is the Rangers. But Zegris very- plays center, doesn't he? Not he doesn't win faceoffs, which is part of the reason. Like I, okay. I understand, you know, he, faceoffs are something that get better as you get older. The more time you spend in the league, the better you get over time at winning faceoffs because you learn more tricks and you learn more techniques. You get more coaching, that type of thing. Like there's a strong statistical correlation with getting older and faceoffs. But Zegers probably is young enough where if the Rangers were committed to that, but I think Zegers is more of just the thought exercise. If it were just from the Ducks. I think of those three, I think the most likely is Hendrik because he's expiring. Vetrano and Zegers are both, if the Rangers were to acquire them, that would require shenanigans for this summer and next year, which is kind of the issue with some of the guys on this list. Same thing with Buchnevich and Gensel. I know a lot of people say, if you're going to give up that much to get Gensel, you need to extend him, which I don't inherently disagree with. I just don't know how practical that would be based on the way the Rangers' finances are at the moment. I don't disagree with that either. I think... 
both options could be right and could be wrong. It depends a lot on what your future looks like because giving you Gensel is going to get nine eight, million, eight, eight to nine, eight, at eight least, to nine million dollars in his next contract. Okay, like that. That's that's fine. Like he's 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 worth every penny of that contract. But that makes okay. Obviously, minus Goudreau, that's that's a given. Three and but, a half, yeah, yeah. But then you have to think about okay, well, your kids are going to need an extension soon, like. You have to think about, okay, well, where else is that money going to come from? You're going to have to... You're banking on like five-ish on the cap going up. Sure. That's what we're assuming, at least five. You've... Either way, I think they buy out Goudreau if they can't find a way to yeah, get rid of him I right agree. now this summer. And then it comes down to, would you rather roll the dice on, you know, Zach Jones, Matthew Robertson, left defenseman, whomstever you want to insert from within yeah. the organization, or upgrading your top six. Because I think that's ultimately going to be the the binary choice they have this summer is do they trust one of those young guys to take a step up and move on from Myron Lindgren to fill that spot? Or do they prioritize retaining Lindgren, which that'll be something we'll discuss more closer we get to the summer. Yeah. But that type of upgrade or do you prefer the Jake Ensel, the Trevor Zegris insert a good top six winger here? Cause I think that's the real biggest hole on this team right now is the Rangers need one more top six forward and they have for three seasons now, yeah. you know, we've done this exact same thing at the deadline. This is the third straight season. We've had to do this now, but that's the thing when you are viewing yourself and by all, by all accounts are one of the best teams of the league. And you know, if you look at the standings, if you consider yourself a Stanley Cup contender, you trade for the best player available. At, at that point, your first round picks mean nothing. At Correct. that point, your prospects, unless it's like Gabe Perot, like I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't trade Gabe Perot for you know for a lot of things. But most of your prospects are available. You won't see them for another two or three years at the at you know at the at the at the earliest. These people, while they are good and they're good assets to have, mean nothing if you can get Jake Ansel and win the Stanley Cup. That's like the that, thing. That's, that's that the thing. like that's the bottom line of all of this is if you are on the phone with Dubis, and I understand like, you know, will Pittsburgh help the Rangers out or whatever, like that's that's a whole, you know, inside baseball conversation for the, for a different time. But like if if the Rangers come in with the best offer of like, okay, well here's two first round picks I don't know. I'm just making things up. Like Matthew Robertson, Bar- uh, you know, Barclay Goudreau, you have to throw in for, for cap stuff. Uh, more picks, a couple, like whoever else you want, I guess Brett Berard. Like, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm throwing things out. But like, here's a blank check. Write whatever number you want, but we will take Jake Gensel and we will win the Stanley Cup. Like that, that's, that's fu- like, and if, if Jake Gensel, let's say he doesn't want to resign in New York, but let's say the, let's say at the end of the season in a Rangers jersey, he's lifting the cup. I don't care. Fine. That's ultimately the big point here. You are going to have to take a risk. This time of year is pretty much only about risk. If we're going to be honest here, you have to have how much risk tolerance do you have? And that's ultimately kind of been the story of Drury's tenure as general manager is that he has felt the group is pretty close. It's why he gave the Fox and Zabinijad extensions. It's why instead of getting long-term guys to maybe fill out the lineup, they've opted to do this. Let's ride out the first half of the season, see where we're at, and then try and address whatever holes we have at the deadline because he feels like he's got the core. And we talk about this a lot and from a team building perspective. What do you prioritize? Do you prioritize having financial flexibility or do you prioritize having your guys that you feel good about? And I would argue the Rangers have maybe leaned a little too hard into having their guys over having flexibility and liquidity. But they're at a point now where it's about this year and it's about next year. And I'm going to tie this to a point about the core. So Zabinijad, Kreider, Trocek, Panarin, Truba. Those are your expensive guys. Those are your veteran leaders, etc. All of those guys other than Truba are already older than 30. Z- Panarin and Kreider will be 35 two years from now. Zabinijad will be 34 or 33. Trocek will be 32, 33. Truba will be 30, 31. At that point, this team is going to have to start transitioning to the Brennan Othmans, the Alexi Lafreniere's, the Gabe Perros of the world. 
at that point, I don't think the Rangers will be in a position to be as serious of Stanley Cup contenders because those guys, the veterans, the older guys, they will have age-related fall-off. And that's not going to be like Stark. I'm not expecting them to be useless, but I do think they won't be as impactful. And we already are a little questionable about the impact of Zabinjad and Kreider right now. And we don't know if Panarin is going to be able to play like one of the five, 10 best players in the world going forward. So I understand the reticence about trading draft picks, especially because people feel good about the way they've drafted the last two years. Like, I, I agree. I'm happy that Osman and Perot are in the system. We need wings. Badly, especially ones that can play on the right. But based on what we know about what's out there, what's available, you can't be afraid this time of year. If you think this is the core, which Drury very clearly does, you got to do everything in your power to give this group what they need. And that is where we can start talking about individual guys, because there are differing skill sets amongst the pieces that are out there. And that and one of the biggest things is how you use your assets. Yeah. Because trading, let's say, uh, again, I'm making things up. Like, if you trade three first-round picks for Jake Gensel, that's fine. That that works. Jake Gensel is one of the best wingers in the league. The Rangers need a top six winger. Great. I'm 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 all on board with with trading with trading. You know your assets. But if you trade a first-round, I'm again, this is not going to happen. I would I would very much doubt it will. But like, if you trade a first-round pick for Scott Lawton, we got I will fist fight Chris Drury. Like that. Like that's where we're at. Where it's the same asset being traded. So it's not like, you know, they're they're creating things out of thin air or adding more than they should, but like you have to trade the assets for for the best available talent. Get trading three first round picks and uh, again, Brent, Brennan Othman, let's say for for Jake Ensel, it is exactly what the Rangers needed. They're going all in. Future doesn't matter because it's all about the right now. If they trade some of these assets that they have for like Scott Lawton or Let's say they trade a first round pick for for Alex Wenberg. I will fist fight Chris Drury because like you're trading your t- some of your best assets for players that aren't difference makers, and that's that's the the line that I draw. You like it's okay to hang on to these assets if you don't like if Gensel's not available, if Eberle's not available, or he gets traded somewhere else. I would rather just hang on to them as opposed to overpaying for a third line center. I agree with you. And this is something we can talk about. The third line center, if they come in, is going to get 12 to 13 minutes at five on five. And ideally, they kill penalties. Ideally. That's a real hole in Wenberg's game. He has been really bad on the penalty kill this year. So much so that that's the biggest negative impact of his value is his penalty killing is actively bad. Now, some people will say, you know, penalty killing isn't exactly a trait. There's environmental stuff within it, but that's a real cause for concern for me. As for the skill sets of the guys, when we're talking about Eberle and Gensel, those are shoot first guys who need guys to do the work for them. And what I mean by that is they need guys to do the transition stuff. They need guys to carry the puck through the neutral zone, to gain the zone with possession, and they're good at playing off of that. If you look at Gensel and you look at Eberle's transition numbers, they're not that great at carrying the puck through the neutral zone and getting to the offensive zone. They like receiving the puck once they're in the zone, and then once they're in the zone, they're really good. We know that's an issue for Zabinijad and Kreider, that they struggle in transition at times because they overwork that tri- that middle pass, that cross-seam pass, that isn't always there. And we've emphasized that the Rangers struggle against well-structured teams because they have that one default play that they're comfortable with. And one last point before we start going through guys one at a time. No matter who they add at the deadline, even if it's Gensel, but even, even if it's Gensel, that is not going to be the reason the Rangers go all the way this year. If the Rangers go all the way this year, it's going to largely be because of the guys who have been here all year. It is going to be because Zabinijad and Kreider figured it out. It's going to be because Shesterkin was one of the five best goalies in the world. It's because Panarin played like a hard trophy guy in June. No matter who they add, more likely than not, is not going to have a huge impact. You know, I was talking about this with a stats friend of mine the other day, and he said objectively, if you wanted to look at it from a math perspective, no matter who you add, at best, you're maybe increasing your odds of winning the Stanley Cup 2 or 3%. We are not talking about a significant improvement in terms of overall percentages. 
it is about the guys who are here. And now we can transition to talking about individual pieces. I, I yeah, like at at a certain point, the rate like hockey is such a team sport where yeah, you can like you could think of it this way. Wayne Gretzky won all those all those cups at Edmonton. He yeah. didn't win them in LA. He didn't win him in St. Louis. He didn't win them in New York. Like no and I and I get it, it was in the twilight of his career in New York, whatever. My man's was diming with Brett Hall in St. Louis and they didn't win anything. Like that's at the end of the day, hockey is the ultimate team sport in that a, a one player does not win you the cup. It, it, it ha- everybody has to be on the same page. It is a team effort. You can't play Gretzky 16 minutes of, you know, every game. Like y- you have to rely on other people to, to pitch in and get the job done when you need the job to be done. Jake Ensel is going to, or Eberly or one of these guys is really going to help the top six at five on five offense. But, they're not going to score eight goals a game by themselves. Like it, that's not, that's not how the sport works. It's that's not how, that's not how, you know, the NHL is, is played. So it, it has to be on everybody to, to pitch in and get this job done. Cause that, like the Rangers are going to, are going to give up assets for four guys. Like this is going to happen. They're, they're going to be deadline buyers here. It's all a matter of when will will these new guys come in and one buy into the system that Laviolette has, which I would imagine that they would because Laviolette's been around for a hundred years. He knows everybody in, in the NHL, and by all accounts, people like him. So I would think that the new guys are going to pit, are going to come in and buy in. Also, because Rangers are one of the best teams in the league, they have a good shot of winning the Stanley Cup. And I, and guys, new guys coming in, I feel like would hopefully maybe please buy-in to, to what Laviolette is, is, is asking them to do. It's all a matter of, hey, everybody that's been here, now is your time to go out there and play the best hockey of your life for two months. And that's really what it does come down to. I know I just said it, but I'll repeat it again. It's going to be on the guys who have been here all year that do the bulk of the heavy lifting. You know, we're talking about high usage guys who are going to be playing a lot of minutes. And we've seen it over the last few weeks with this fourth line of the two kids in Goudreau where, you know, they're getting seven minutes a game, six minutes a game, Edstrom and Rempe. So I think that's a strong indicator that they're going to add at least two forwards, if not more, frankly, the way they've used the fourth line over the last few weeks. Because if they can't be trusted now, you know, against these, against like the Blue Jackets, they're not going to be playing Rempe and Edstrom in April against the Hurricanes or the Flyers. You know, it just wouldn't make sense based on how things have gone over the last month. I think the one very underrated thing about Matt Rempe that, Maybe we're not talking about it. He keeps Goudreau off the ice. I mean, yes, that for sure. Also, because he's a big, tough guy, the Rangers won't add another one. That does help. You know, like, I mean, he can go back down too without we're having yes, to clear waivers, yes. which like, is good. That is an aspect because at this point, the Rangers have done it in the past with John Scott, Ryan Reeves, guys like that that just don't know how to play, but they they're big, they, they tall slash they they're wide and they're they're scary you know, to, to, to skate up against the Rangers don't need, like they, I would very much be, I would be very surprised if they went and added one of those other guys to the roster because they already have one and he's 21 and the fans love him. The coaches love him and he can go down to the AHL without an issue. Like Matt Rempe is somebody that is actively making the team better because the Rangers don't feel like they need to add more toughness because he's already in the lineup. It's a good point. It's not something I had really thought of. And on the bright side, I don't feel like Rempe is the kind of guy that needs to play every day. So if he's up here as the 13th forward, I don't think that's big of a deal as opposed to say like, how they've wasted Zach Jones as the seventh D most of the season when he should be getting reps in in Hartford. So if Rempe stays up, fine. I do think they're going to add two guys. One question I had for you, and we can start talking about individual guys based off of this. It feels like they're going to roll in an ideal world where Brodzinski is going to go down to the fourth line. Do you think if they kind of, I don't want to say strike out, but if they can't add a decent center, do you think we're going to end up with Brodzinski as 3C, Gaudreau as 4C going into the playoffs if they can't get, you know, the Henrik type that they clearly want? No, I think they will find somebody. I think 
regardless of who it is, I think they find somebody that is better than what they currently have to fill one of those spots. Okay. I like Brodzinski. So you been, think if Brodzinski stays and he's the three C, they get a four C that's better than Gaudreau, so they could play Gaudreau on the wing. Either that, or they get somebody to just play three C and get Brodzinski down on the four. Like I, 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 that is to my core what I think Chris Sherry is going to do. Now, who that player is going to be is anybody's guess. But I think because, especially because Laviolette does not like Barclay Goudreau, like that's been, it's very clear by his usage that Barclay Goudreau is, is kind of there. Like he kills penalty sometimes. Like he's, you know, he's there when he needs to be. He's, a, he's kind of a, a utility player for Laviolette, but he's not somebody that Laviolette has a lot of trust in. Especially offensively. I mean, Barkley Goudreau has like, what, one goal this season? So the Rangers, I, I would bet my bottom dollar that Chris Drury is going to find somebody that could provide more offensively in that position. So uh, whatever whatever happens, if they strike out with the big guys, he's going to find some kind of supplementary trade to, to beef up that bottom six. So of the centers that are out there, we know that... Um by oh, Wemberg, who we've talked about, who is being held out of the Kraken lineup today for trade reasons. Um, Adam Henrique can play some center. Warren Fogle, who I know he's not a trade deadline guy in the traditional sense, but we know if the Oilers are going to make an addition, he's likely going to go have to go out. He's somebody I would be interested for that role. I want no part of Tyler Johnson or Scott. No, 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 no interest in either no, of those guys. No, no. If this was like five years ago, maybe, but not now. No, Tyler Johnson hasn't been a good hockey player since 2017, if we're being generous. Yeah, he's, I, I don't want, and, and I feel like he'd be too expensive for them anyway. Like yeah. he's, he's not somebody that the Rangers, I think, are going to even take a look at. Maybe, maybe they thought about it for a split second, but because of his contract and also like, he's not just, he's just not very good anymore. I don't think they approach him. I agree with you. I will say it does worry me that Larry's listed him in his column over the last couple of weeks because generally I will say Larry doesn't hit like he used to because the Rangers just don't leak as much as they used to. But generally speaking, he's got a good grasp on who they're looking at, not who they ultimately get. But I do feel like he has a good grasp on who they're looking at. I who's mean, the he, who's the who's the Montreal Canadian that, that he's been asking? Josh for Anderson. For? Josh yeah. Anderson. This man, this man has been talking about Josh Anderson for for, for a decade. Since also, he was in Columbus. Yeah. Also, in, in I think maybe it wasn't his re- most recent one, but in the in one of his most recent comment uh, columns, he was took a shot at Kravtsov for some reason. Like my man's my man's will cling on to people, and he oh, will no. not let go. He's a generational hater. He keeps his beefs indefinitely. I mean, it took Buchnevich <laughs> going to St. Louis and being a point per game player for him to be like, okay, I was wrong, as opposed to at any point during his Rangers tenure when he was very good. Yeah. So I've got some stats for each of these guys that I found interesting. Uh, just on Buchnevich, in the three years, so from 18 to 21, the 56 game season, when he played with Zabinijad and Kreider, 63% goal share, 52% expected goals more than enough evidence it works vetrano not as much not as strong and i understand the nostalgia that 2022 team that team was a lot of fun you know that it was great to go to the conference finals as the underdogs where nobody we didn't have any business beating pittsburgh let alone carolina and then getting within three jacob truba third period penalties of being up three nothing in the conference final you know that team had no business to do that i think a I don't think Vetrano works, partly because the money into next season. And the transition stuff that is holding Zabinijad and Kreider back, he's not good at either. Like, there are other guys on this list that don't have good as good of transition stats. Like, Vetrano is really fast in a straight line. Somebody like Duclair, who's also very fast in a straight line, entices me because he's cheaper than Vetrano. And they don't have to worry about the money for next year. That's not to say Duclair is better than Vetrano. Yeah. It's that he's probably not going to cost nearly as much. And you don't have to worry about shenanigans for next year either. The thing about Duclair is he's a good middle six winger. Yes. His defense is non existent, which could be a problem for the Rangers. But he's somebody that could provide good scoring. The problem is, is that Vetrano doesn't work consistently. 
And I understand, you know, he's having a great year in Anaheim. He's scoring a bunch of goals. And I think Fitz uh, Fit, at Fitz Chiasen was like, he's a, he's a he's like a Jeremy Grant type of player. And if you don't know the NBA, Jeremy Grant's a player that like, if you put him on a bad team, he'll score a bunch of points. He'll look amazing. And then he'll get to like a really, really good team. And then he will not nearly have the kind of production that he has on a bad team. And that's a really, that's a good comparison for somebody like Frank Pachano. Now, he could replicate that when he comes back to New York. Sure, I'm not saying he can't. He has, clearly he has the ability to score and, and you know, provide good things to his hockey team. But I trust Frank Petrano to score at least a little bit more consistently and provide more two-way game than Anthony Duclair. He, Duclair will be a lot cheaper, sure. Like If you could get him for, I don't know, I'm just making it up again. Like If you get him for like a fourth-round pick, a third-round pick, by all means, these picks mean nothing. A third, a third, a third round pick that might be somebody good five years from now. I could not care less. If if all Duclair's worth is like a is like a middle round pick, by all means, he's not going to actively hurt your team. Rangers are not going to be worse if Duclair comes back to the Rangers. It's a, it's all a matter of you know you only have so many spots in the, in the in the lineup, you only have so much ice time to give to everybody, and you only have so much cap space. So if you get Duclair, okay, well then that limits your scope of who else you can go get. So if if Duclair if Duclair is the best player the Rangers get at this deadline, that is a failure. But in and of, but in and of itself, Duclair is a fine player that would help the Rangers. He just can't be the best forward they get. See, but I think that's a little subjective because like it, if you add Adam Henrique, is Adam Henrique better than Duclair? It depends what you're asking them to do. And I think that's part of this as well. Same thing with like, if you were to look at like Jason Zucker or um, not Vetrano, I'm trying to think other guys like Nick Dowd. Like if we're talking about guys of that ilk who they're not flashy, they're not great. They're not going to put up a ton of stats. Like if Henry comes here, his pace is going to dip. Like he's at like 42 points and like 60 something games, which is decent for a guy who's probably going to end up not getting power play time. Same thing. A lot of these guys are getting power play time in there, which is, uh, I know something a lot of people have pointed out about Vetrano that a good chunk of his production has been on the power play this year. And that won't be the case here because nobody gets on the first power play here for some reason. But in an ideal world, they're adding two forwards. And I, I said this last week. I've said it more than once. I want an old body seventh defenseman here. That's not just Zach Jones. I I, I know Zach Bogosian's probably not going to happen because it seems like the Leafs are in on him. But they need somebody of that ilk where I won't be shitting bricks if they come into a game. Like if, if it's game five of the first round and it's the swing game and it's 2-2 and Zach Jones has to draw in for Ryan Lindgren because he took a puck to the face for the millionth time. I'm going to be worried if it's Zach Jones and Braden Schneider on the third pair in a swing game against somebody in the playoffs. I'm not, I'm not, I think I'm a little bit less sorry than you are. I like Zach Jones a lot. I think he provides more than the Rangers think he can. That I'd agree with. Like he's definitely not as bad. Like the fact that the Rangers, I won't even rotate him into the lineup occasionally. Like that's kind of strange to me. I understand. Like I get you know, you can't sit Gustafson, like uh, you can't sit in any of these guys, but at the end of the day, I, and I feel like they're going to do this post deadline in these last like 10, 15 games. They're going to give, if Zach Jones is still on this roster, he is going to get games in. This is the time of the year where Lindgren sits a few games because he's, his whole body's broken because he gets, he, he takes nine hits to the back a game and he blocks 19 shots like this. This is the going to be the time that you're coming up where a lot of these guys sit. So now we, you're going to have guys like Jones and, you know, whoever maybe, maybe Robertson gets a game just to just to see how he plays. This is going to be a time of year where, where they where they slot in. But I like, yeah, if, again, if if the if the cost isn't too much, if you don't trade an absorbent fee for a seventh defenseman, that's fine. Like as long as it's somebody that you can trust to, to, like you said, as long as it's somebody that you can trust to fill in in a crucial time of the of the playoffs, by all means, uh, you, you don't give up a first round pick. I would say for a seventh for a seventh defenseman. But if you could get like, I'm not too big on Bogosian, but there's some other guys around the league that I, I would imagine are available that aren't awful. 
and that may might be fifth, sixth defenseman right now. That if you trade for them, and you know, like they they wouldn't mind just being that kind of black ace in the press box. So I think the thing that's good about this deadline, as opposed to last year and maybe other years, there's really only like three players I want no part of that are rumored to be available. Unlike years past, generally speaking, there's like a. 10 guys they could add more than that. Honestly, it's probably like 15 to 20 and it would probably be fine in all honesty. You know, it's not like years past where they misidentified or they brought in guys based on what they had done in other stops without a conscious understanding of who they are now. You know, if it's Jason Zucker, it's not sexy and he probably isn't a first line player on a good team, but he's not bad. Same thing with Duclair, same thing with Tarasenko, Vitrano, Henrique. If they bring in Nick Dowd to be the 3C and they can bump Brodzinski down, that would probably be fine. Yep. You know, there are a lot of options because the Rangers are kind of in the market for a few things. So as long as they don't like trade for like fucking Kyle Opozo, it, it's really not a big deal who they add. You'll generally feel good about who it is. Like, yeah, I'm not the most bullish on um, Wenberg, but he's better than what they've got right now. Yep. He probably won't cost a ton because he's an expiring contract. He doesn't put up a lot of counting stats and it makes the team better. That's really what, why I feel a little more optimistic at the deadline this year than I have in years past, because there are a lot of guys out there that can do a lot of different things. It's just a matter of which one do they get and how much does it cost? I would agree. I think in years past, there have been, and also, again, you made this point earlier on where you just say any players like the Rangers, people will believe you. But like in years past, and this has come true in a lot of in a lot of years as well, um, where there's going to be player A who makes a lot of money. Uh, maybe the maybe the fire truck that uh, is passing by it can be a tra- uh, can be acquired by the Rangers at the deadline. But uh, but in years past, there's always at least one or two names that were linked to the Rangers for, for like Patrick Kane last year, for example, was one of the guys that was broken and he's, he's playing a lot better this year and, you know, take it for what it, for what it is, at least, you know, at in the points department, he's playing better, but that was a guy that we were worried about for months. Patrick Kane, the Rangers, Patrick Kane, the Rangers, Patrick Kane, the Rangers. And we were, you know, we were fighting against her for the whole time because uh, we saw it la- like we saw it last season how he could not play. He literally could not play last season at all. And there is no player like that this year, which is at least at a bare minimum already better. Yeah. Like there's going to be guys that I w- don't want, like Scott Lawn, I don't want Tyler Johnson, I don't want, but. At the very like bare minimum, I can if the Rangers do trade for them, I can at least be confident in their ability to not be skating on one leg. Yeah, and that's really the good thing here. Yeah, more likely than not, who they add is not going to have an outsized influence on what happens the rest of the way. But if it makes the lineup deeper, it gives them more opportunities, and that's ultimately the biggest thing. Do how many different paths do the Rangers have to winning giving games? I know the last few weeks have been a good test, a good barometer where they, you know, they've had the blowout, they killed the Devils. They also won the squeakers against Dallas and Colorado. They played pretty well against the Leafs. I would say the Leafs controlled play, but it wasn't like they played poorly. That is a good barometer. And I'll leave you with this parting thought to kind of wrap up the episode. The Rangers haven't had a functioning first line at five on five since November. They have one defensive pair that's trustworthy, and that's only because Adam Fox is on it. It's not because the pair itself is particularly good. The goaltending had been bad through January, and the Rangers are, I think, have the second most wins in the entire league. It's either first or second. I forget over the weekend. Yeah. They were first going into the weekend. But with all of that working against them, they have one of the best records in the entire league. The roster is going to improve and they still have a first line center in there who is capable of being a really good hockey player if they can get it out of him. And this is against the backdrop of an Eastern Conference where the only team that really scares you is Florida. I know some people will say, well, wait to see what the Hurricanes do. Wait to see what the Hurricanes do. I'm not worried about the Hurricanes. I'm not worried about the Bruins. I'm not worried about the Leafs. 
I'm only worried about the Panthers because all those other series, you know, it'll be slightly in the Rangers favor, in my opinion, in terms of talent and depth. But the Florida series is the only one where I feel like Florida has a definitive talent advantage as opposed to any of the other teams I just mentioned. And the Rangers have room to get better, which is why I feel so encouraged. And the thing about Florida, too, is I can't trust Bobrovsky. Yeah. I, I, I listen, I, we all watched Bobrovsky play like an absolute animal last, last postseason. We all saw it. The, the six weeks that he literally carried the team to the final, we all watched it. Oh, like, you know, that, that is not lost on me. The problem is, is that he's shown to be very hot and cold. So he's hot for six weeks and then cold the next, you know, like he, he hasn't been a consistently great goaltender for a while. Now uh, he's, he's having a great season for the most part in Florida. Like, yeah, like they're, they're, they're playing well, but, but Brovsky is the kind of goaltender that if you just catch him at an inopportune time of his, of his ebbs and flows, like that series can get away from them pretty quickly. And one, and one thing here before, before we go, cause I, I mentioned this, to you in the, in the text before uh, before the recording. I have some names here, and Chris Bengal, friend of the show, uh, wrote a, a list of 10 guys that are p- probably on the trade market, probably going to get moved. I want one sentence from you on viable for the Rangers or not, and who you think they're going to go to. Okay. Number one is Jake Ensel. Uh they probably won't trade him in division. Everything I've read is it seems like Edmonton is going to try and do the home run trade because they're desperate. Noah Hannafin. Uh, no, nah. I, I would like the Rangers to upgrade lefty. I have Chikrin in the graphic I made because Chikrin would be a major upgrade from Lindgren, but I don't think, I don't think he's going to get traded at the deadline. I think he'll get traded at the draft. UC Soros. No, I don't think he gets moved at the deadline. He'll be a draft guy if he gets traded too. Adam Henrique. Yeah, he's definitely getting traded. It's just a matter of where he would work for the Rangers. He's probably my first choice for the three C. Sean Walker. Um, interesting player, decent underlying profile, but I feel like he's going to end up with a more D needy team. I think the Rangers are a D needy team, but they are they don't think they are. Unfortunately, Tarasenko. Uh, yeah. I, I think he ends up in one of the teams that's trying to push their way into the playoffs. Like that screams 2024 Lula Morello giving up a, a first and like a third for a guy who he could have had two years ago for a lot less. Pavel Buchnevich. Um, I don't think Drury likes him in all honesty. I don't think Drury likes the player. I, I would love him back. I don't think Drury likes the player. Well, where does he go if he gets if he gets Vegas? Traded? I think Vegas is going to trade mm. for him either way, and that team's going to look infinitely better with a real puck mover. And you know, just deepen your lineup. The rich get richer. All of the cliches, but Vegas is a well-run team for a reason. Jacob Chikrin. I would love Jacob Chikrin, but the Rangers don't think they have a lefty problem. So, I, I, Chikrin. Where does he go? I think is a dead lo- um, a summer trade. I think he ends up getting moved to a team. I really. Th- I would love Jacob Chikrin as a Ranger because him and Fox together would just do so much more for Fox because he's having to do so much right now. I would love that. Scott Lawton. I am not interested. I'm sure there is a dumb general manager out there that wants that. He would be good for a team like Ottawa. He would be a good for a team like the Ducks, the Blackhawks, a team that knows it's not making the playoffs, but is a good character guy in an environment where winning isn't the expectation, that would make sense. But if a winning team trades for him, I don't see it. Last one in the article is Frank Vetrano. Um, I don't know if he's going to get moved. I, I know the, the the speculation is that the price is really high and that may deter some teams, but he's a useful player. I don't think he's going to be worth what he goes for at the deadline, but if you're Carolina, add him to your top six. If you're the Rangers and it's part of something else with like Henrik, sure. Vetrano would work. He's not my bonus because bonus because you put them in the tier maker, but Alex Tuck. Sure. I don't know what that trade would look like, which is kind of what's confusing about it. Cause the Rangers yeah. don't have the money to make that work. Cause Tuck makes like five and a half. So there'd have to be money going out. Like I don't, and we can end on this note because it, it, I know it's come up more than once. I don't think it makes sense to trade Kako because you're just making another hole. That's not to say there yeah. isn't a trade where trading Kako makes sense. It's just, if you trade Kako in getting another forward, you're just making another hole. And maybe, maybe they think Austin's ready to take that third line right wing. Spot. No, no, but, no, no. 
if they if they thought that he'd be getting games now. I don't disagree with you, but that would be the only way I could see trade and Kako making sense is if they were comfortable with Osman playing, which I don't think they are, which is why I don't think trade and Kako makes sense. And I understand like Verbeek was at the Ranger game over the weekend and the Rangers have been linked to Henrique and Vetrano for quite a while now. And Kako makes sense. He fits in their age group of guys like McTavish and Troy Terry and Zegris. But I just I don't think it makes sense because the the thing about Kako is he doesn't put up a ton of stats, but he's a good player and he's inexpensive. Yeah. The Rangers need inexpensive players as they move mm-hmm. into this next window, as this group of veterans gets older. Even if you want to trade Kako and if you want to have that conversation down the line, you know, it's not an inherent no for the right pieces in return okay if you trade Kako then you need a similar player with similar money and a, sk- and a similar skill set who out there is available that could slot into the 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 kind of job description that Kako currently has that wouldn't break the bank for this team part like a, a big part of his usefulness yeah he's a good player on the ice sure but also he's cheap. he's, he's cheap he is young and he's cheap. And when you have that kind of utility player, that kind of Swiss Army knife that could do a lot of good things like Kako does, and he's young and he's inexpensive, that is worth so much to a general manager that trading him for peanuts and essentially getting uh, an older version and a more expensive version of the same player does nothing for the team. And the, one last thing on it. He's only 23. They've got four more years of team control on him. And because he doesn't put up a lot of counting stats, he's never going to be that expensive. Yeah. So I don't think there's a world where it would make sense to do that. Um, That'll do it. I think we're going to attempt to do a live show on Friday around the deadline, depending on availability, what happens. Hell, if all the trades happen before Friday, it wouldn't really make sense to do a live show because we'd have even less to contribute than the guys all refreshing their e- refreshing their emails for, you know, the conditional seventh round pick for Scott Lawton type trades that'll happen at 258 on what Friday. So, yeah, obviously, uh, trust, get good sources, your friends. Your friend, anyone with rumors. The graphic designers are really good at knowing what's going on because they break a lot of news before the insiders do. So make friends with those people. A lot is going to be said over the next five days. Uh, Get good sources. Click on the profile when you see a tweet that may or may not be a transaction. Make sure it's Elliot Friedman, not E-I-I Friedman, that type of thing. Let's let's all be smart out there. We, We cannot let the trolls win. Uh, that'll do it absolutely for this week's episode of the liberty blue podcast make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcast leave a five-star review on apple Podcasts or spotify drop the video a like and subscribe over on youtube we will see you guys real soon later